let's get the show on the road, shall we? Welcome to the Morning Brief. We're live for you here in Lagos, Nigeria's commercial capital. And guess what? She's Bukola Koka. <laughs> and I'm sitting by Bukola Koka. But my name is Jeffrey Uzama. How are you guys doing? It hasn't changed, guys. <laughs> you know what they say, seasons come and seasons go. But time really is a great revealer of what really matters. Health, your productivity, values, and especially family. And uh, we hope that you're taking all of those things very, very important and working towards them. Good morning and welcome. As they say, I am Bukola Koka. <laughs> you know, I just wanted to take a moment to celebrate Bukola. We wanted to take a moment to celebrate Bukola, really. She's like, Bukola the, should be smiling when we're saying She'll this be. Thing. You shouldn't be keeping it straight. You know, this week is all about celebrating. Like, Bukola. we woke up this morning and we came to celebrate you. So yeah. you should be just. I mean, you had a special that, sketch like, done for you yeah. some days back. I mean, with the hair, with the smile and all of that. If there's a woman around you today, just look to her and say, I celebrate you. Because, I mean, just imagine the show without a woman. <laughs> it would just be <laughs> two of us. Hard, hard, with hard face, hard right? Hard faces, like, <laughs> strong. Me. Anyway, welcome to the show. <laughs> okay. I'm Kayode Okikiolu. So you wanted to respond. Oh, you wanted uh, well, to respond. Well, I wanted right? to say thank you. I, yeah. I was wondering where it was all coming from, but I know that I, I also pull up some surprises sometimes. Are you shocked that we're celebrating? <laughs> On both of you, so. We yeah. promise you we do not want anything. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, it's just a few days to um, Easter celebration, and I was just thinking about it. Easter, Christmas, somehow Christmas takes the shine. But mm. Easter is equally important. Some would even say, maybe more important depending on the way you look at it but it looks like they don't measure up and i wonder what is responsible is it the december feel is it the fact that there is uh snow in some parts of the <laughs> world and what there's hamatan in some other parts and during easter mm. it is heat what exactly <laughs> i've always wondered people don't share as much gifts uh mm. during easter people don't uh converge as much during easter and i'm wondering easter matters too Jeffrey, no, you want to go I, first? I think again, uh, it, it depends. You know, th this is for the, the, the Christian faithful, uh, is what it signifies at the end of the day. So, Easter, of course, the death and the resurrection. That is something really solemn. Mm -hmm. But in a deeper sense, for those who believe in the Christian faith or follow the Christian faith, it is one of the most important things that happen because if he didn't die, and res resurrect, um, we wouldn't have salvation. Mm. That is what a Christian faith believes. Uh, but the other one is just about the birth of, 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 the, of the child Jesus, according to the Christian faith and all of that. So perhaps it is the depth of what it is. Uh, well, some people say if he wasn't born, he wouldn't die. If he didn't die, he wouldn't be. So it's a mixed bag <laughs> of a lot of things. However, you know, it's also the fact that in the calendar, uh, towards the end of the year, you know, December, everybody wants to, you know, just wind down, right. close the books, get to relax, reboot for the next year. So the vibe, the energy and all of that is quite high. I was born in December and it's one of my best months. I love the of Christmas season. Of course you would love I that love season. It. <laughs> I love it. For what, there's an atmosphere that comes yeah. with it, you know. Uh, but when it comes to Easter, it's more, low, it's more of super reflection, like... Somebody died mm. and resurrected. So what are you giving to give life to all the people, basically? Fantastic. Beautiful, Jeffrey. And um, you covered much of my thinking, but some part of my thinking in you know, some of what you have said. You know how truth can be hidden. And the truth is sometimes hidden. And the truth is that without Easter, there would be no Christianity. It really does codify the foundation of the Christian faith. And without the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, there would be no Christianity. There would be uh, no identification with baptism. And that really is uh, the reason for Easter. And because, uh, you know, the, the truth is sometimes not readily embraced, it is hidden, as I said, and that's the reason uh, that uh, Christmas often seems to take the shine. And by the way, Christmas is my favorite time of the year also, Jeffrey. There you go. Because some 
special people um, in my life were born in Christmas. And you received On Christmas you. Day. Yeah. It, it, wow. it means the atmosphere, too. There There's you. this thing about Christmas. Maybe, maybe it's our, our own little, not snow, but the cold weather. They have, mm -hmm. But this Amatana has taken holidays. It now resumes in January these days. So, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's going on with the Amatan. Have you noticed that sometimes we expect the Amatan in December? It doesn't show up. No show, mm -hmm. bro. Mm -hmm. It shows up in January. Me, January. Amatan is like, I'm, I have issues to deal with myself, <laughs> so let me face my own issues. <laughs> but you know, what I just realized um, on, on this conversation is a lot of people will celebrate your birth. Mm. Uh, you, you will find as much people perhaps during the burial, during that moment. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important not to live your life for people, mm -hmm. really. Because at that time when it matters the most, mm -hmm. a lot of them will not be there. So make sure you live your life doing the things that really matter yeah. to you, to your creator. Not things that matter to people because when that time comes, mm -hmm. all the people that jubilated and ate jello fries <laughs> will most likely not be there. But yeah. hey... <laughs> That's just food for thought this morning. It's a breakfast <laughs> show, right? But let's tell you what we have for you. It's a bumper package, as always. We have just about less than two hours to deliver what we have for you this morning. So let's get started, shall we? It's a busy week of decisions, uh, which the government says is expected to improve the nation's economy from the hike in the interest rates yet again by the Central Bank of Nigeria to President Bola Tinubu's establishment of the Presidential Economic Coordination Council and the Economic Management Team Emergency Task Force. But the question is, how much will the experience of the prominent names on that list count in boosting the nation's economy? That's a big question we seek to answer this morning. Well, from national decisions to personal decisions, how is your mental health, particularly amid these challenging times? Physical health gets a lot of attention, but mental health matters also. So what do you do when there's so much to wrap your head around? How do you stay mentally fit? How do you help others who may be going through mental health challenges? And that is also very important. We we'll bring you real life scenarios and get help from the experts as well. That will not be all. Plus, we meet a man who is planning to do something really mm -hmm. extraordinary and also mm -hmm. very dangerous, mm -hmm. but for, for a good cause after all. Now, he will travel the length of the third mainland bridge, not on wheels or on foot, but below the bridge in the water. Mm -hmm. The thought of it alone can get you squirming on your chair, your <sighs> head spinning. Mm -hmm. But we hear from this daring athlete on how he plans to achieve this cause. So, hey. For those of you who think you can swim, what? you need to check in on your swimming skills. I because mean, I, this weekend, a gentleman, the what? third mainland bridge, will be his playground. His playground. playground. Yeah. I mean, I'm learning to swim. and um, nah, I can't swim. I was encouraged by somebody seated right beside me. Right, well, good well. job. So you're that, learning to swim. That two, you can swim now. There are two people seated right beside me. Yeah. You know, somebody um, encouraged me to learn to swim. But swim that length. Come on of distance and time. and time and well, well we'll hear from the man okay <laughs> he's going to be here to answer all of that question <laughs> not to worry yeah. we'll, we'll get answers to those questions and particularly for people who just swim in the bathtub and you have, you have tried to graduate <laughs> to the pool or to the kids <laughs> section but hey as we as we always do your comments are up from about 7 20 thereabouts and we'll do that all through the show if you've watched this time and again you see that we're big on comments and interactions with our audience. So that is talking about you. Send them in your questions, comments, videos, what have you. Send them in on WhatsApp. Uh, the number will be on your screen and screen any moment from now. You can just go online, hashtag CTV Morning Brief, or just tag our brand new handle at CTV Morning Brief. Uh, at, the, at the end of the day, bring those cameras out. Yeah. And uh, I'm really curious about that, gentleman. <laughs> I just want to see it happen. But, hey. <laughs> We're looking forward to it, that conversation and all the things that we're seeing from the federal government. Yeah. It means they are taking this economic issue quite seriously. Everybody's mm -hmm. on board. The third, number one citizen, number two citizen, number three citizen, everybody that has to be hands up questions. Well, we'll talk about it. Yeah, Coyote. So, are you ready? I bet you are. We'll start with the top stories that will shape a conversation. Big stories, really. The breaking news and the rest, just in a few seconds. So stay with us. It's the Morning Brief.
Our top stories at this hour will begin with President Bola Tinubu's vow to fish out the perpetrators of the Okwama military massacre of March the 14th in Oweli South local government area of Delta State in which 17 officers and men of the Nigerian army were killed. The president, who was special guest of honor at the burial ceremony of the military men who was set to have gone to the community on a peace mission, applauded the military for their restraint. We shall do for ministers. On behalf of a grateful nation, we honor the sacrifice of Ali and the other gallant patriots who died that day. They will forever be remembered as heroes who answer the call of duty and paid the ultimate price. Each man now belongs to the hallowed list of service men and women who defended our country and protected their fellow Nigerians, not minding the risk to their own lives. They have all been awarded now. A posthumous national honor. The four gallant officers have been accorded the award of members of the Order of Niger, M-O-N. The 13 courageous soldiers who also lost their lives have been awarded the Officers of the Federal Republic Medal. I commiserate with the families of our fallen heroes and the entire armed forces. I share in their pain and grief, the grief you carry today. It is my prayer that God will comfort all who are bereaved as a result of this tragedy. I want to make it clear once more that those who committed this heinous crime will not go unpunished. The president's vow to fish out the perpetrators is also echoed by the chiefs of defense and army staff who also spoke about the people that they left behind. It's no longer news that 17 of the Nigerian army's finest men, whom we have come to bury, were murdered in a reprehensible manner on the 14th of March this year in Okwama community in Delta State why they went on a legitimate peacemaking mission. It grieves my heart that it took our search and recovery effort over 72 hours to recover some vital organs of the decapitated and disemboweled bodies of my men that were scattered all over the Okwama community by the community youths and their friends. I consider it the most barbaric act any citizen or community can commit against the authority of the state. And I must place on record that a lot of restraints have been exercised so far in our search and recovery efforts for missing arms, ammunition, other equipment, and body parts. Well, the fight against oil theft continues in the Niger Delta region. This time, the NSDC has uncovered illegal refining sites in rivers and um, Kaibam states. The NSDC authorities maintain that the efforts are being stepped up to curb crude oil thefts to the barest minimum and affect the criminals. Look at the nature of this illegal operation taking place in this vicinity, you will know there is a cartel involved. By the time we start our investigation, a thorough investigation indeed, 
we will unravel the mystery behind this unscrupulous and nefarious activity. Now to economic matters in what it describes as a strategic move to strengthen the nation's economic governance framework and ensure robust and coordinated economic planning and implementation, the presidency has announced the establishment of the Presidential Economic Coordination Council, that's the PECC, and the creation of the Economic Management Team Emergency Task Force, the EET. A statement by the Special Advisor in Media and Publicity to the President, Ajirin Gilali, outlined the membership of the PECC as follows. The President will chair. The Vice President, Kashim Shatima, will be Vice Chairman. Also on the Council as a President of the Senate, a Chairman of the Nigeria Governors Forum, a Coordinated Minister for the Economy and Minister of Finance, Governor of the CBN, and 12 Ministers. The key members of the organized private sector will also be a part of the Council joining for a period of one year subject to the President's directive and they include Alhaji Aliko Dangote, Mr. Tony Lumelu, Alhaji Abdul Samad Rabiu, Ms. Amina Maina, amongst others. Well, the formation of these teams, according to the statement, will complement existing economic governance structures including the National Economic Council, the NEC, which is chaired by the Vice President. While the Economic Management Team Emergency Task Force, the EET, on the other hand, which replaces the Economic Management Team for the time being, is mandated to submit a comprehensive plan of economic interventions for 2024 to the Council. Well, the released students of the LEA Primary and Government Secondary School, Kuriga, in Chikun local government area of Kaduna State, have been reunited with their parents after three days uh, since they were released. So the children were handed over to their families uh, by the Secretary to the Kaduna State Government on behalf of a governor as Governor Obasani. The parents of the rescued children were excited and relieved to be reunited with their ward after more than two weeks of sleepless nights and tense anxiety. They commended the efforts of the security agencies and intervention of the state government. Well, let's talk politics now. Uh, after days of protest and controversies, Mr. Julius Aburi has been re-elected as the national chairman of the Labour Party by 387 delegates at the 2024 National Convention of the Party in Newi, Anambra State. The chairman of the National Convention and Deputy Governor of Abu State, Mr. Ekichukwe Mitu, declared him winner after the delegates' hand affirmation. I want to express my deepest appreciation and gratitude to all the delegates to this national convention for the trust and the confidence reposing us to continue as members of the national community. I also want to appreciate our own deputy governor and through him to all others from Abia State who came to assist us in giving life to this program today. More stories now. The federal government has declared Friday, March the 29th and Monday, April the 1st as public holidays to mark the 2024 Easter celebration. A statement by the Permanent Secretary of the Minister of Interior, Mrs. Aisha Tundaya Kusens, the Minister of Interior, Mr. Lubumi Tunji Ojo, who made a declaration on behalf of the federal government, urged Christian faithful and all Nigerians to emulate the sacrifice and love of Jesus Christ, who died to redeem mankind. The Minister Father urged Nigerians to show acts of charity and generosity in alleviating the material conditions of less privileged Nigerians. A business news now. In a rapid succession of changes, the exchange rate used for customs, import duties and cargo clearance has seen its fifth consecutive decline in less than two weeks. From 1,612 naira per dollar on March the 15th, it has now dropped to 1,405 naira, 46 color per dollar. That's according to data from the Nigeria Customs Service. But these fluctuations highlight a consistent devaluation trend showing the Naira's resilience against other currencies across both the parallel and the official foreign exchange market. That would actually mean the Naira gaining, not being devaluated. Meanwhile, over the last two weeks, there's been a consistent and significant surge in the Naira's value, rising from 1,615 per dollar to 
1,382 naira per dollar, and that's March the 26th. And outside the country, two uh, bodies have been recovered under the collapsed Baltimore Bridge. And the bodies of the two people uh, were recovered from a red pickup truck which was submerged under the waters where the Baltimore Bridge collapsed. While an operation to recover the bodies of four more people presumed dead continues after a container ship crashed into a bridge in the U.S. city of Baltimore. The two victims have been named as 35-year-old Alejandro Hernandez Fuentes and 26-year-old Dolian Roniel Castillo Cabrera. The U.S. Coast Guard says more than 1.5 million gallons of fuel, oil, and cargo containing hazardous materials are on that ship, but there is no danger to the public. Over here in Africa, voter collision is over in Senegal, and Mr. Diomaye Faye has officially been declared the winner of Senegalese presidential elections, winning 54.28% of votes in the first round. Report from the country's vote counting commission, which falls under the judiciary, states that Mr. Faye placed well ahead of the governing coalition's candidate, former Prime Minister Amadou Ba, who had 35.79% of the votes. And on to sports news, Spanish prosecutors want the ex-head of the country's football federation, Luis Rubiales, jailed for two and a half years after he kissed a female footballers at Spain's World Cup victory. He is facing charges of sexual assault and coercion after he grabbed Jenny Hernoso and kissed her on the mouth last August. Now, according to a court document seen by Reuters, prosecutor Marta Durantes charged Mr. Rubiales with one count of sexual assault and one count of coercion, charges which carry prison terms of one year and 18 months, respectively. Well, those are the top stories at this hour. As you can tell, some of them will form a major part of our conversation on the show and in the coming days. But let's now turn our attention to what you are saying about the top stories on the news uh, this morning. Of course, Jeffrey joins me to walk through your comments. A lot always is about the news. So uh, naturally, people have been reacting to what's been going on in the polity. Uh, from the speech by the president yesterday, uh, when the soldiers were laid to rest, the ones who died in Okwama whilst on a peace mission, as well as the re-election of Julius Abure, which are some of the things that people have been talking about oh, on yes. X and on the social media. So let's get straight to it. Uh, uh, this particular person, uh, Jeet Phil, says, great speech from the president. God bless this nation. And he says, peace. Absolutely. <clears throat> and I think that was a moving one, especially when you hear about the, uh, the people, uh, the officers and men left behind, uh, some of them pregnant, uh, some of them now orphans. Well, it's cherry to hear at least that uh, there's scholarship plans uh, for exactly. the children up until the tertiary education. So those are some of the comments you have there. Great underscore Magnus also says, I hope this trend continues for other slain heroes of ours, also killed in North by bandits and Book of Haram. Uh, Adeyemo. Uh, says, uh, may their souls rest in peace to abductors, hoodlums, terrorists, harassing, uh, maiming and killing innocent Nigerians. May you never know peace. All Nigerians should take intelligence gathering and sharing as personal duties. Security agencies should seal off systemic loopholes. An amazing one, <clears throat> as is to Excuse say, particularly about the speech, saying it was emotional uh, mm. from the president. And he ends with uh, a prayer, you might say, that Nigeria shall be great. Absolutely. Babatunde says, uh, think this is better. At least they made provision for the families, which is quite important that if you have to lay your life down for the country that you love, something should give a return at the end of the day. So we commend the federal government and those in authority for being thoughtful, mm. uh, especially with the children up to tertiary education level, including the ones that are not born, because we understand some of the soldiers, they are... Well, Wives are pregnant. Indeed. Uh, quite a sad scenario. Well, Olari W, with a few figures also, you know, toes uh, that line, essentially praying for uh, the souls of the soldiers and um, the family as well. But well, we'll, we'll turn our attention now mm, to politics, ahead. Jeffrey. Yes. Uh, this one has gotten a lot of people talking from the non obedient <laughs> to the obedient and you know, the Labour Party members, and even Labour, the Labour movement itself. And it concerns the re-election of Mr. Julio Sabure as uh, Labour Party's national chairman. Of course, we brought that to you in the top story. So, 
Well, congratulations may be in order for favor 9978 who says, I hope he does well with the party, but that's not before saying congratulations uh, to him. Okay, the avocado, that's what you call yourself, says, let's the same, or is it let's the same people, I guess that's what you're talking about. Or is it the same people? Okay, is it the same, oh boy. Is it the same people <laughs> calling for his removal that still voted him? <clears throat> maybe not. Yeah, yeah, maybe uh, not. Absolutely, it's, it's a bit of a divided house, indeed. you know. Uh, the governor, the presidential candidate, I don't call for a shift in the convention because some housekeeping needed to be done. The Labour, uh, Nigeria Labour Congress also yeah. calling for a shift and all of that. But hey, uh, we have not even started talking about that Papa group. And so there's a lot of, there's so a lot there's that went. Literally like three different yeah. groups now. There's yes. the Labour movement itself, yes, the Labour Political three to four. Commission. Yes. There's the Abure, mm. there's, there's the Apapa. There's the Apapa. And then, and there's, then obedience. There's, a, there's a group, yeah, ob yeah the obedience. Uh, they are, so they're not really involved in the politics. They, right. are, involved in, they are interested in the person uh, which, are, which they coined that name after. So mm. I, I guess wherever he goes, they go with him. And he wasn't at that. No, he wasn't at that. Yeah. I think he was one of those that called for a shift just for some housekeeping, wider consultation yeah. and all of that. Even the governor, the only governor the Labour Party has. So it's going to form a lot of talking points as to whether or not this will follow through eventually with Julius Abure re-elected. Yeah. Um, this Austin is coming... Alpha? I think that's next, right? Who is this? Uh, that's Austin uh, Alpha. Okay. Und yeah. Austin underscore Alpha. Yes. And it's yeah. a hope, essentially, saying yeah. that I hope his re-election will bring more transparency in the run of the party and lead to victory in the coming elections. There you go. Yes, I was looking for Austin. But <laughs> let me move to Isaac Anyako. It says, without state delegates election first. Now, wow. That, that was another, that was another, you know, argument about how elections should be conducted from to be from the local government to the state and the world looks lo, local government states and then to the national but maybe Julius Abure and his ESCO will be able to explain to everyone whether they did that and you know and, and I heard it was supposed to hold in Abia it right. was later shifted to Newin and Ambrose. So there's a lot going on. Right. Uh, our job is just to report it and tell you what's going on. And uh, also to <coughs> Put out some of your comments. And speaking of that, this next one is from uh, Joseph OKK saying, Congratulations yet again. Congratulations, congratulations. Well, the next one, Jeffrey. Uh, quite interesting. Creative critic says, Aburi needs to clear himself of all allegations first. I think that's quite important. Mm -hmm. They've been coming like in droves, literally. Um, but, well, let's see what the party does after this. And I'll just take this one from <clears> Generation <throat> Foot 2 saying, he should allow for independent audit to take place. That's after the congratulations. Sir. So, those are the things you've been talking about as far as this issue of the Labour Party National Convention is concerned. Uh, it was uh, full of a lot of arguments back and forth, but the convention has been done. Yeah. What now happens to the validity of that convention is left to the party members and those in authorities to know what to decide and go forward. But we've always said, in a democracy, there must be this robust opposition. Absolutely. It is not safe. So uh, all the opposition must get their acts together. The PDP, we're still looking at the PDP. You know, we're not sure what some things, you know. Sometimes they are quiet, sometimes they are active. So there's just a lot of things going on. And then the Labour Party now with all this division. So, well, uh, all politics, the pol politicians, really. just, just get your housekeeping done so that uh, we, we know the direction we're looking Absolutely. and know who to call. To and call the people what? should also ensure that yeah. you put them to task, right? So if, if you're caught napping, things will happen. But if you are, if you give them close marking, as they say, then you, you see that the politicians will sit up and do what is right. We have a lot of talking points for you, but keep those comments coming in. Hashtag CTV Morning Brief. You can also do it on WhatsApp. Let's get started with the big topics of the day. Yes, we're getting closer to the holiday, but very soon we'll need to talk about some of these issues that would even go beyond the holidays. And we started off with mental health issues. It's very important. So stay with us right here. It's a morning brief.
Welcome back to the program. And we're starting off with mental health. You know what they say uh, about men mental health. It's okay not to be okay. Um, you are not your mental health. You're not your mental illness. But oftentimes when we're not okay and, you know, we have cases of mental illness, what do we do about it? How do we take care of ourselves? Because they say... Um, Prioritizing our mental health is a form of self-love. Well, let's have that conversation. As we have joining us on the program this morning, Dr. Olushegun Ogunubi, who is a WHO certified mental health advocate and senior lecturer, University of Lagos, consultant, psychiatrist, Grace Cottage Clinic, Lagos. Dr. Ogunubi, good morning and welcome to the program. Good morning and thanks for having me. Yes, yeah, so we're going to start with um, statistics. Uh, speaking of which, you know, last year we had that report from the Yaba Psychiatric Hospital that there was a 100% surge in cases of mental uh, illnesses and they were driven by economic conditions, most of them, according to the medical director of the institution. Now, at that time, uh, things were not as difficult as they are now. We've experienced, uh, you know, a surge in prices of commodities between December 2023 and uh, March. Speaking of which, um, from your standpoint as a medical practitioner, have there been also increased cases of mental health conditions uh, driven by economic factors from what you have seen as a practitioner between that time and now? Uh, that's a very uh, wonderful question. And it's unfortunate that we're in a time like this where economic action, unemployment, political crisis, all these things are affecting people's mental health, our mental health. And to go straight to your question, I will say yes. However, the calamity is that while we've seen increase in the cases of mental illness, we discover that not even everyone can afford the treatment. So we see more cases, but they're not coming forth for care because they do not have the means to take care of their health. So now people resort to spiritual belief, even when they know that they need to combine their spiritual belief with healthcare uh, services. What do we have? We have a situation where people will tell you, oh, I just want to spend three days. I just want to spend one week. And people are discharging against medical advice. Why? Because they cannot even afford the care, both in public and in public, in private uh, healthcare institutions. So we are having double-edged sword, where people have illness, they cannot even come to the hospital for care, but they would rather seek alternative form of therapy, which they consider available, accessible, and uh, uh, easily affordable. And that is the situation we are having now. So every time people say, you know what? I'm ready to fill the Dharma form, which is discharged against medical advice. Ah, no, you can't do this. This is a situation we need to use medication. No, 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 it's okay. There's no money. We cannot afford it. We are not even eating, not to talk of taking care, take care of someone who has emotional illness. So that is further increasing the body of mental illness in our society. And it's quite unfortunate. And of course, we'll get to the reason why people cannot afford what is happening to the social welfare in terms of taking care of those who have emotional illness instead of them or their families paying out of pocket. Because when they pay out of pocket, then we have situations like this. But if mental health care is part of the basic social welfare that people should enjoy, then we can say we will see more surges and then we will take this more surge in the increase of mental illness and then we will be able to take care of them. But what do we have? People have illness, they contact the hospitals, we tell them this is the bills, we have reduced the bills as much as we could, but they will tell you, we'll call you back again next time, and they never show up. Those who decide to show up after one week, and we know that the care of mental illness cannot be taken, you know, completely you know, overcome within a week or two. 
but they decide to go for alternative form of therapy, which is sad. And not just sad, but it's also quite telling about the situation of things. Speaking of which, um, you can confirm that there's also an increase in the cost of treatment, which is why, uh, you know, they're uh, opting for other means. And then you can also tell us what are the symptoms of those who are coming down with mental illnesses, the ones that you have seen, particularly in recent times? Yeah. Mm. So by uh, by prong approach to your question, thank you very much. I'm going to tell you that, of course, increase uh, increasing the cost of mental health care is there. For example, those of us that run private healthcare institution, I remember in those days when we want to go and buy food for the clinic, we would likely take taxi anytime we want to buy food around two hundred thousand, five hundred thousand. We will go to the market and taxi. We have to come into the estate to supply the food. But now with 500,000, the cook will go and we just take, Ghana must go. The food is there, I say, what? Is this 500,000? And because of that, we need to also take care of these people because they have to choose what they want to eat. We we'll we'll take care of them in a dignified manner. They say, we want this, this money. Why not compromising the healthcare standard that we give them the services? We discover that we need to increase our prices. Even in public institutions, the price is a little bit increased. But even at that, people cannot afford it. And what are the symptoms that we are seeing around? It is not uncommon that in a situation like this, we will have cases of increase in addiction. That, I can tell you, is so preponderant. Where people, and, and why? When people cannot afford the three square meal, they cannot take care of their wives, they cannot take care of their children, they go into depression, and in a, an attempt to overcome the depression and anxiety feelings, they resort to maladaptive coping strategy. And there are many forms of maladaptive coping strategies. Time will not permit us, but I will quickly say addiction to different forms of drugs, alcohol addiction. You know, they want to just drink themselves and drink their sorrow away, not knowing that the sorrow cannot go away. Once you are okay, you will come back to your problem. And then the next thing is they want to take again until they get from the level of purposeful use, control use, and then they get to the level of dependence. So dependence on alcohol, dependence on narcotics, dependent on opiate, dependent on, you know, amphetamines, stimulants, all sorts of things. People are taking all sorts of things now to get high. People burn rubber, gutter water, people pick latrine, petrol, air deodorant, air freshener, anything, even including fire extinguisher. They take any form of thing to get high. Paint, thinner, whatever you can think of, people just inhale, smoke inject, drink, so as to get high, because these are the substances that affect mood, behavior, and thinking. And so when they take these substances, they are not able to feel any problem, and they think it's okay. Until they get to addiction level, and they can no longer control, but the drugs are the one controlling them. So that is the problem we're having. We see cases of depression more now. People come around with depression. Some of us, so, 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 some people will come with anxiety. Some will have post-traumatic stress disorder. Maybe they've laid up a lot of people in their place of work, and the next thing is, oh, will I be the next? Will I be the next? Chaotic environment all around us. People are anxious. People are having panic attack. All of a sudden, you just feel as if you want to die. You just feel as if you want to collapse. You feel as if your breath is seizing. You can't sleep. You can't sleep, so many things. People are coming up with psychosis. You know why? When people have lofty dreams, when people have ideas, I'm going to graduate so, so time, I'm going to marry, I'm going to do this one, and all of a sudden, things are happening. All your friends have disappeared. You can't see them. Some have died, some have disappeared, some have jackpots. Have... At the end of the day, you just look at your life, that's, what is the essence of life? <clears throat> is it not just... So many people are dying that we are not even knowing. Many people are having a lot of 
emotional problem that is further increasing or worsening or aggravating their physical condition. When I cannot sleep, I'm always thinking, what will happen to my blood pressure if I'm hypertensive before? My blood pressure will surge. And when the surge is, what happens? It affects the kidney. The kidney will shut down. So many people are having increase in physical condition as a result of psychological imbalance. Because there's a nexus between our mental, our emotional state, and our physical condition. And so many people are going to private hospitals, public hospitals, for hypertension, for renal kidney problem, for many other physical problems, either two that would not have shown up or be exacerbated if their mental state has been very calm, if there's a job, economic stability, they have money to spend, everybody is happy, everybody is cool. So you can see that it's a vicious circle we are having here. Doctor, I'm having high BP. Doctor, my tummy is paining me. Doctor, I cannot sleep. I'm having my grief because the man is thinking. Why? Because of fear, he will be laid off. How will my children go to school? What are they going to eat tomorrow? So we're having a chaotic cycle, emotional problem, physical problem, all of them. And unfortunately, there's no money to take care of them. So what happens? People resort to alternative form of therapy. They take all forms of concussion, which are not regulated. And this for that damage the kidney, damage the intestine, damage. You know what? We have problems on our hands. It's a chaotic situation. And that is why when economic situation is like this, we should not only think of, oh, inability to eat and cook, we must think of the consequences that this is, uh, these things are having on our mental health and the effect, second effect, <coughs> on the physical health and this vicious circle. Uh, let, it's quite an expansive uh, explainer that you've done, and we, we, can, we can literally see the entire picture. But let's, let's bring a bit of structure to the data. In terms of male, female, uh, girls, boys, uh, what category of people do you see this um, thing impacting on the most in terms of people going down with mental health disorder given the economic situation of the country? Yeah, to be candid with you, I'm very sure that researches are ongoing. Uh, for example, I spoke with a professor of mine, Professor uh, Biodu, Professor Mrs. Abiodu Rishewe of Olavis Onobajo University. And then she was talking to me about, she's a professor of pediatrics, and she was talking to me about the number of minority children presenting in children emergency world, unprecedented rates of case of malnourished children. So in terms of how it's affecting, children are coming up with malnourishment, protein imbalance, partial core and co. Now in terms of adults, of course you know most of the time, women tend to seek help more than men. So you're going to see more of women in the hospitals seeking help. Men, we believe that they can, you know what we see in our society, money talk. Strong men don't cry. Real men don't cry. We are not changing the slogan that real men do cry, they weep. Real men not only cry, they weep. And it is okay not to be okay. You know? And that is why, you know, having a problem is not a problem, as Moba sang. The fact that you have a problem is not a problem. So we are changing the statements now. So most of the time, men don't come. Men would rather think, 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 till they have physical conditions or they die, till they think of suicide, till they become depressed, or they go into addiction. But most of the time, we will come. But this is affecting both men, right. male, females, children alike. And it's quite interesting the way you put it, that it's OK not to be OK. Uh, men don't just cry they weep and that's okay as well and i'm just wondering for those listening now and they're like i can relate with this this is literally me you just painted whether a man woman or or young person and they're thinking what kind of coping mechanism can i then engage what can i do to help myself i, I don't know how much people are willing to visit uh, a counselor talk more a psychiatrist or to get medical help 
it's not a big thing here, even though we're trying to, as much as possible, encourage people to get help. But at least start from where they are right now before they then escalate it. What is the best coping mechanism? Some say, I'll just limit my exposure to the outside world, limit my exposure to social media, try to just cut all of those things and, you know, um, and exist in my bubble. For some other people, they go all out. So what is the best coping mechanism first to begin with before you then escalate to get help? There is a, a, there's a trial that we normally use when people are depressed. We say a state of worthlessness, a state of helplessness, a state of hopelessness. So I tell people, the first thing you want to do is that you don't want to get to that level of hopelessness, worthlessness, and helplessness. Therefore, I bring the message of hope. I'm not Mr. President, but Mr. President has been giving us hope. Hope keeps a man alive. The day you remove hope from the life of a man, that man is nothing. And when I say man now, I'm not being gender specific. Hope. Because once you become hopeless, mental, you are opening the door for mental health issue. When you see yourself that you are worthy, you are capable of doing something, you are living, you are not only existing, you are closing the door for or closing the door against mental illness. When you see that help is around you, you don't see yourself surviving alone. You know that help will come. That is another way of closing the door against emotional trauma, emotional problem. I will, so these are the things that no one can do for you. You are the one that will do that for yourself. Keep hope alive. People have survived on hope. People have been stranded in the sea, on the highland, and the only thing they had left is hope that they will be, some, they will be rescued one day. And from literatures and co, we have seen that that hope has been able to keep them alive. The next thing is, this is the time to recalibrate. This is the time for everybody, every family to readjust their course of living. This is not a time to say my my friends' children are going to private hospitals, uh, private schools. They are traveling four times a year. Oh, I don't want to be left behind. I want to also do. And what do I say? I say, cut your coat according to your cloth, not according to your size. It is not. In fact, that is a old. There is an old adage now. It is cut your coat according to your cloth. So if it is one yard you are. Is it top and short maker? You don't have to get a bad out of it. So you must begin to limit your cost. Know that these are the things I can afford. Oh, for now, I can't take my private car out. Let me join the public bus, transportation. These are the things I need to, these are the schools I can afford to take my children to. These are the meals we can afford to eat. Children, our family meetings. Children, situation is not like before. The money that my take home, my take home pay can no longer take me home. These are the situations. It is not a shame. Don't pretend. Oh, you, your children are overseas. They are schooling. You used to send them two thousand every week. Children, we need to manage this time around. Find a job to do during the holiday or during after school hours. These are the amount I'll be able to send now. This begin to cut costs. And then the third thing I will say is, think inward. What can I do? that will fetch me multiple stream of income? What are the gifts that I have? What training do I have to go and get? And the truth is that government should not take you out of poverty. <laughs> me, <laughs> I don't see the magic happening very soon. I will want to survive. So you need to begin to think, do I know how to weave? Oh, I've learned tailoring before. Oh, I'm good at fish farming. Oh, I'm good at agriculture. Oh. You may have to go back to the village, acquire some land, and, you know, produce. So just begin to think. Begin to think, oh, my car, let me register it for Uber. After work, maybe I'll just do one or two trips. At least it will fetch me additional source of income. Okay, you know, and these are the ways that people can survive this economic instability and economic situation. 
You know, what, what you said about not allowing oneself get to the stage of helplessness is very, very instructive. Uh, and I hope the mes message hits home, particularly to those who are going through uh, mental health issues, such that uh, they don't get to that point of no return uh, where they take that uh, decision that doesn't help them and doesn't help their loved ones. Um, for those people around people who are going through mental health, how do we help them? How do carers help those who are going through any form of depression or mental health challenges? Lovely question. And I want to say these are common questions that we get from time to time. Relatives will call us, oh, my husband is going through this, uh, he's no longer active, he doesn't have interest in sexual relationship with me, he doesn't play with the children, He's always in his room. He said he's always out drinking. He has picked up habits that he's not used to before. Oh, my wife has changed. She's now so panicky. Any small thing, she's anxious. She has breathlessness. Oh, this, we get all, all sort of this. And the question is, I've told her to seek help. I've told her to do this. She said nothing is wrong with me. There are some states, there are some psychological states people get to. They end up going to denial. They are aware of it, but because of the addict that, oh, you must be a strong man. Only the weak get depressed. You know, that's what we say. If you say, I'm depressed, they say, are you weak? Come on, be strong in the Lord. The job, the Lord is your strength. What is wrong with you? We try to, you know, ginger people, as we say. But when people are in that state of depression, where they have low mood, where they have, you know, reduced ability to do things, and they are so weak, and they have pessimistic view about the future, future looks gloomy, they're in that melancholy state of mind. There is nothing that you can say that can get them out, and that's why you need to seek help for them. I always say that there's always somebody they respect. There's a level in which you can cancel them, you can assist them, you can help them, you can give what we call social support. If somebody is thinking that he doesn't have money and everything, Sometimes getting that person additional source of income may get him out of depression. <laughs> There's what we call flight to health. It's a phenomenon where just changing people's situation, they will be okay. And most of the time, people go to some of these, you know, alternative form of therapy, and then they provide one solution or the other, and they're okay. And they say, oh, I've cured him, I've healed him. It is flight to health. Why? Because maybe it's in reality depression. It is not due to internal problem, familiar problem, and co. It is due to circumstances around that person. So if you have the means to help, it's not a matter of praying for someone or helping someone to seek for help. When the way you can help that person is right within your, uh, it's in your pocket, or you have a job you can offer that person. I don't want us to be hypocritical about it. I've seen people that have sought help for people, but in my mind, I'm like, this lady is going through a lot. You can help. <laughs> This man is going through a lot. You have the means to help. This is the time to come together and help one another. So if you cannot help and you two you are struggling and you are trying to cancel, then look for significant others in that person's life who he or, who he or she respects a lot. And then say, you know what? I want to talk to you. You have been observed to be doing this. This is against your normal norms and the, the way you used to act or behave. You will need help. You need to see doctors who are specialized in mental health. If you mention psychiatrists, they will run away. So many of my colleagues said that, that we have used different names. Some to some will say we are neuropsychological agents. Some will say we are neurotherapeutic. Some will say we are neuroscientists, behavioral. So we just try to pack it. But psychiatrists are medical doctors who this residency and eventually trained to specialize in human behavior and abnormal behavior and and bring them back to good health. So that will run away when they hear psychiatry because of the stigma. So you talk to them that there is a you know mental health counselor, physician, just for the significant person to be able to convince these people to come around for care. But before then, what do they need? Can I provide? Can I help? Can I assist? These are the ways because we must come together to help each one, helping one.
Thank Doctor, you. we just have barely one minute to, to, to wrap up this conversation, but we would like you to speak to the issue of the impact of social media on the mental health of people and how to work around it. One minute, if you can. Thank you so much. Social media is doing a lot of good, bad, and ugly. <laughs> you can see. I will not come here to say that social media has failed us and social media has helped us, but ability to maintain the balance. If you notice that each time you read news about, because for a long time I wasn't on social media because I just discovered that when I wake up and I read news, oh, trailer crushed 1 million, 1,000 people. Oh, 50 people have been laid off. Oh, 70 people killed. Oh, you know, I just avoided it because I can't wake up in the morning and the first thing I go is either on X or I go on Instagram, Facebook, and all I see, I hear, I feed my mind with you no know, negativity. So people must understand that. Social media has also provided opportunities. Sometimes you have questions. If you have 500,000 now, what will you do? And you see over 4,000 comments. And you read through the comments, oh, what are the ideas people have with 500,000 naira? And then that can help you as well. Job opportunities on LinkedIn. People have gotten to US, Canada, America, uh, UK, just by getting job on LinkedIn that they were in Nigeria. People have seen opportunities. So we have the good, the bad, and the ugly. I would just advise people that they must learn to maintain the balance, not spend excessive time feeding their minds with negativity and cook. But if it is for entertainment, fun, you are able to laugh. As you are laughing, you are increasing endorphins, you know, good hormones that will make you feel happy. It is good when you use it. But when you notice that this thing is affecting, it's ability to know, man, know thyself, know yourself. And when you see that it's affecting you adversely, try to stay away for a period of time. Thank you. Uh Quite a productive conversation that we have had so far, Dr. Ogunubi. And there are two uh, operative words that we're perhaps taking away, help and hope. Hope for those who are mentally challenged and for those who are caring for them, uh, um, helping them as much as we can. We'd like to thank you very much for your time on the program. Dr. Olusha Ogunubi is a WHO certified mental health advocate and senior lecturer at University of Lagos. Thank you very much for coming on the program. And we hope that helps you as well as it has us on this side of the divide. We'll continue with our conversation as we switch gears to the next segment. Stay with us. We'll be right back. The considerations of the committee at this meeting focused on the current inflationary pressures and the need to anchor inflation expectations as well as ensure sustained exchange rate stability. These considerations underscore the importance of the CBN's commitment to the price stability mandate and the need to urgently bring inflation under control to ensure that purchasing power of ordinary Nigerians is restored in the short to medium term. Members noted the continued rise in headline inflation, driven largely by food prices because of supply shortages and high costs of logistics and distribution. The committee, therefore, was of the view that addressing food insecurity is key to containing current inflationary pressures. On this note, members commended the ongoing efforts of the federal government towards addressing food insecurity. Some of these measures include the provision of various palliatives, release of grains from the strategic reserves, distribution of seeds and fertilizers, as well as farm implements for dry season farming.
Welcome back. We now shift gears to talk about the economy. We have joining us an economist, Professor Bongo Ade. Professor, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. When it comes to the issue of the economy, there are, sometimes you don't even know where to start. That's why we have people like you to make sense <laughs> of the situation. The aspiration of the government, they are targeting to taper down inflation by to get as low as 21%. We're already at 31 So how do we get back to 21 uh, by the end of the year? The CBN governor will have to answer that. We're looking at food inflation hitting almost 40% now and all of that. So these are some of the things that we want to explore in terms of the diagnosis of, of um, the CBN governor, because if it's not properly diagnosed, the solution may not be appropriate. But before we ask you our first question, we have uh, breaking news coming in. Uh, that the military, the director, rather, defense media operations, Major General Edward Buba, uh, is calling on Nigerians, especially residents of Delta and adjoining states, to assist the military, military with credible information that will lead to the arrest of eight persons. You're seeing them on your screen, allegedly responsible for the killing of 17 soldiers in Okwama community in Delta State. Uh, addressing news conference on the activities of the troops in various theaters of operation, General Buba says the military remains determined to fish out the perpetrators of the heinous, heinous act in Delta State. General Buba also reaffirms that the military is committed to rescuing all kidnapped and abducted victims in Nigeria. So, uh, pictures of eight persons, uh, seven men and one woman, wanted by the military in connection. Allegedly, we must add that line, uh, to the killing of the soldiers that's a breaking news just coming in uh, from the DHU. That's the defense headquarters in Nigeria. Well, let's come back to our conversation, Professor. So he's focused largely uh, on the issue of food inflation, which he says if, if it's tapered down, uh, it's going to help a lot in, in all of this. So I want your own diagnosis, perhaps. Do you agree with the CBN governor on the approach uh, that is being taken in diagnosing this situation and the uh, panacea that's been put forward, how far reaching is it going to be? Yeah, very tough questions. Uh, <laughs> just as, as you pointed out when you started, it's a, this is a very tough time being an economist, you know, because most of the things are so unpredictable. And then um, uh, I think some of us have realized over a very long time now that Nigeria's economy seems to have tapered off the theoretical you know, assumptions. So when you still pursue policies uh, based on textbook uh, you know, theories, uh, a lot of things you know, uh, go missing. So I think, yes, um, I appreciate and I commend the, the deliberate effort of the CBN to render an inflation. But we have to look at some fundamental, you know, things. And then to also diagnose, I like that word, where the inflation, um, you know, uh, uh, push is coming from. Um, I, I think the first thing is data. Uh, some people report that Nigeria's inflation is above 96%. Uh, okay, so um, if you look at it, um, and there are reasons to believe that. Because um, if you follow such, uh, you know, uh, more robust uh, data uh, uh, capturing, uh, you will see there's some level of validity in it. Because uh, Zimbabwe has an inflation level of about 1,520% annual. Um, Argentina has 180%. Uh, then you have South Sudan. Um, Turkey has about 76 uh, percent you know, annual inflation rate. So when uh, the same sources uh, show that Nigeria's inflation is higher than what we hear, there is a reason to believe that. So first, we need to uh, you know, be sure that we have uh, the right data so that uh, the policy can work. Because when you make uh, policies based on uh, data that is not so uh, robust, then that's a big problem. Now, then the, the, the next point is, okay, um, has the problem been properly diagnosed? So, the first thing is, um, let's look at the drivers of Nigeria's economy. So, we have four of them. Uh, the first one, which is the big one, is, the, is trade. Okay, what, are, what do we trade? We export um, crude oil, uh, mainly. 
uh, and then we've seen that our current accounts, uh, which is the difference between the imports, uh, the export and the imports, um, has not been doing badly in recent times, has somehow returned to uh, positive territory. Then the second one is uh, capital flows, which uh, we're talking about foreign direct investment or portfolio investment or whatever you have. You have. Capital importation in Nigeria has almost dried up. And then we are not seeing those uh, really transformative investment coming in any anymore. So that is a, a huge loss to the economy. And then the third one, which is diaspora remittances. And that is something most people don't talk about. Uh, in the past, we will have people patronizing either the banks or the international money transfer organizations, IMTOs, to send money back home. In other words, there is real uh, foreign exchange. But what has happened in recent times is that that is no longer happening. So if, uh, people, Nigerians, uh, the diasporans, diaspora Nigerians abroad want to send money home. They look for their peer, okay, peers who have uh, maybe uh, businesses in Nigeria that have Naira. So you see um, um, currencies just being exchanged in the country where they are residing, and then somehow they manage to find Naira here. There is no uh, exchange actually taking place. So what, it mean, what that means is that it's an inflationary push. Okay, so the last one is policy. So we've seen a lot of policies in the United States. Currently, the United States um, has become very stable. Uh, the economy is quite stable. Uh, they have record level unemployment rates, okay, which is below the, the natural rates. Uh, I think 3.1% uh, or thereabout. You know, so normally you will have unemployment rates about 5%, 4% thereabout, but it's quite low. And that is coming from the, the, the COVID-19 interventions where they paid households so much money and then they still have this pent up, uh, um, you know, capacity of uh, purchasing power that have not been spent. So, and then you have low energy costs in the United States, driving manufacturing, even for Chinese firms are closing shops in China, preferring to go to the United States to set up plants, build new plants. So uh, manufacturing competitiveness is returning to the United States. So that means that, um, you know, so even some other firms that would have considered us, um, you know, some <coughs> attractive uh, investment destination may not be coming. So when you see investment shifting away from us, and then so we now have to struggle with a whole lot of things. And then, demand for, for even inputs, both uh, imported and domestic, is not being met. Um, the challenge at the port, I don't know if anybody's following that. You know, customs, raising the rates of, you know, the rates of uh, tariff and all of that. So it has affected uh, productivity down, uh, down here. So I'm happy that the CBN governor mentioned logistics, the cost of logistics. But what he didn't mention is the cost of production itself the cost of inputs. Now, we've seen, um, yeah, he also mentioned that um, um, uh, palliative has been read out for the poor people and all of that. But we haven't seen anything. We've not heard of any sort of intervention for the rear sector, right. for the manufacturers. And then we've seen so many manufacturing firms closing shops in recent times. So the challenge you have inflation is not necessarily, yeah, some people say it's money supply. Yes, money supply is very high. Okay, and then we can understand the CBN stance, you know, the hawkish monetary policy stance of raising rates. Now we are looking at a NPR of 24.5% or thereabout, so which is, uh, I think, highest in, in historical record yes. you know, so far. Interesting. So, uh, some of the points you made, yes. uh, pardon me to butt in, the Zimbabwe case, some will say it's a peculiar situation. I have an inflation just recently now, 55%. Uh, and. We're at 31, and imagine what we're going through. You can only imagine what Zimbabwe is going through with that. So I think that's a case for us to look at and say, we must not get to that point, as you've rightly said. Even the customs want to. It's, it's good to see that the, the forex, at least being used to calculate the, 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 uh, you know, the duties, has yes. dropped for a fifth consecutive uh, time in, in the past two weeks. But the rate is, uh, sorry, the value or the, 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 the duties itself is another thing entirely. But as you were speaking, uh, I was just going through some of the recent things that government has done. It looks like government is trying to throw a lot of things at it from the CBN to the executive itself. And just yesterday we saw the, uh, the establishment of the PECC. I need to get that correctly because there are now a lot of them. You need to be sure. The Presidential Economic Coordination Council, PECC, and what is called the EET. The EET is the Economic Management Team Emergency Task Force. You know, if the names 
were enough to rein in inflation. These names <laughs> who do great things. But when you look at the composition, yes. the president is on the PECC. You have the vice president, the Senate president, literally all the big names, lots of ministers and billionaires like uh, Aliko Tiangote, Abdusamad Rabiu, Tony Lumelu, and the rest. And then you look at the EET as well. You see the big names on it. By the way, the EMT, the Economic Management Team, will take some break for this period of the EET. How much uh, do they bring to bear, and I'm talking those big names, in changing things? Because you see, they've done quite well for themselves. Billionaires, obviously, have done well. But we've seen this before in some sense. And it looks like the president is trying to tinker with you know, these structures. How much do you see this changing the fate of our economy? Yes, it's going to change the fate of the economy. And I've been talking about this for a very long time now. Uh, in the classroom, when people ask me, even on, uh, on TV, um, so we we can take a cue from South Korea. Uh, South Korea, you know, had a rampage in um, inflation um, uh, in 2022. Okay, after the invasion of uh, Ukraine by Russia, and then energy supply constraints, and then they were coming out uh, of COVID-19. So it was really hitting them very hard. So uh, it was clear that orthodox monetary policy wasn't working. Just the way we've also uh, said about Nigeria's um, uh, system, over a very long time, the economy disanchored from every sort of intervention by the central bank, and it didn't start today. Um, so we are looking at a period uh, starting from around 2018, okay, during the time of MFL. We've been complaining that there is this microeconomic disalignment. So uh, whatever it is that is being done, monetary policy committee, monetary NPR rates, was not, you know, affecting the economy in any positive way. So it was clearly sterile. So um, when you have this sort of situation, what countries can begin to consider is, uh, um, you know, unorthodox, um, you know, uh, policies not necessarily monetary. And then one of the things South Korea did, as I reference, uh, is to you know, begin to call together the Chebo in South Korea, you know, the industry leaders. So you know, directly engaging with them, interacting with them, what do you think we need to do? Because these are the producers. When you talk about the race sector, those who are engaged in the race sector activities. So you mentioned Tony Lumel, mentioned uh, Dangote, and the rest of them. So these people really, they understand, they are market facing, they understand the needs of the economy, the, what to do to increase productivity. So that is what should have been done you know, even as early as last year. Mm -hmm. Because as I mentioned, um, the inflation driver is not just monetary supply that has uh, surged, you know, beyond control, but it is also the lack of productivity in the system. So it's one thing I was going to say, you know, uh, that we have, um, you know, tabled what we are going to do to consumers, you know, palliatives and all of that. But nobody has had anything said about what to do to producers. Right. You see? So this is the first time I see some bit of an effort towards engaging the producers but in the, the economy. But the said that, that they were going to give how many billions to, um, to producers in that speech he gave last year? So, but we haven't, seen that, we haven't seen that happen. Right. We haven't seen that happen. Uh, if it's happening, so why would they allow firms or uh, companies to be closing every day and leaving the country and causing massive unemployment? And that's loss, loss of productivity. That actually increases the inflation. So we are just talking about food inflation. Food is not just agricultural products, by the way. Okay? Food is all the things that people spend money on, that they eat, mm. they consume. So some of them are imported, some are produced, you know, FMCG. So let's look at what is happening to the fast-moving consumer goods. Mm -hmm. Because that's a process sector that really tells us what goes on in the system. So many of them today are suffering, okay, closing shops, going bankrupt, you know, closing op operations. So we need to begin to look at how to re resuscitate that critical sector. And that is the only way we can begin to drive down the inflation level. Uh, so this is the, you know, um, the, this team, the constitution of this team, whatever it is called, I think is a step in the right direction. And also, you know, sometimes also when you have money, I'm happy that they're beginning to rein in the, the um, uh, exchange rates. Um, some, we recommended last year that perhaps uh, the approach to handling this would be to maybe 
move away from the CBN uh, system a little bit, just have to kind of uh, put a temporary, uh, you know, the, uh, moratorium on the e economic management team. Right. So perhaps that could have happened, and then set up some like a currency board. Okay, so a currency board could have helped, you know, in arresting this. I know that after the Second World War and all of that, uh, when countries got independence, nobody talks about currency boards. But some countries like Hong Kong have used this effectively, even though they were hot during the Asian financial crisis in 1997. And then we have Singapore and some other countries using the currency board. So what it means is that they really have to peg every one of their currency they print to, a do to the dollar at whatever rate, and then they maintain it. So it's different from floating the economy, and it's also different from fixing the exchange rates. Right. So that's a way that, like he was talking about, anchoring inflation expectations. So it's a way to anchor foreign exchange inf uh, expectations. So these are some of the things I think should have been done. But um, well, they are coming now. Let's see that um, you know there is real intention to get things moving. Well, speaking of things that are being done prior to the establishment of the council. You said quite a number of things um, in your initial commentary. Uh, first would be that uh, there's a disalignment between uh, fiscal and monetary policy uh, and also uh, that, um, well, I'm, I'm losing my train of thought here, but let's start with the diagnosis, which was well, the first few things that you addressed. If the CBN governor acknowledges, you know, that uh, uh, food inflation is being driven by uh, security challenges. So why then would the response uh, to um, inflation, the need to drive down inflation, be an increase in, uh, you know, the uh, interest rate? Interest rates. Hmm. A very, very interesting <laughs> take there. Yeah, so very incisive. Um, if we go by a logic, that means the CBN is taking the wrong approach, so backing the, the, the wrong tree, right? So that's exactly what it is. So food inflation, as he admitted, is caused by logistics. I mean, um, we have uh, security issues, insecurity. But I don't think that is the only thing about food inflation. We have mentioned that many firms are no longer producing because of the rising cost of inputs. Okay, the rising cost of inputs. So, um, is that the right approach? Monetary policy, okay, monetary policy rate is not working. <clears throat> let's, let's face that. So, what can happen where we are right now is if they continue to push up the rates, inflation situation will continue to worsen. I understand they want to rein in the, uh, the surging uh, money supply, but again, like you rightly pointed out, have we diagnosed the source, you know, the causative factor to the rising monetary supply? I've given you one, which is the, the illicit diaspora remittances, okay, that do not pass through the official channel. So we are losing. So the, the huge foreign exchange loss there is significant enough to cause inflation. So that needs to be also addressed. And then the proper way to address that, because I, I was looking at, you know, um, in the, uh, on the list yeah. to see if I, you know, there are some diaspora elements there. Right. But I, I'm not sure that I saw anybody in the diaspora. The diaspora, Nigeria, today, is a very important economic driver. Let us realize that. Even when we're talking about investment, Nigeria's diaspora population could be a veritable source of foreign direct investment in the nation. Uh, this is a fact. So are there you know, uh, concerted efforts to engage with them? Right, so this is no, not a matter of uh, the way the diaspora, uh, I don't know which agency, has been dealing with things. And that seems to push people back also a little bit. I, I'm, I'm looking at a situation where, just as they've set up this committee locally, there is also another committee that begins to engage with diasporans. That has to go with moral suasion to get them to you know, begin to uh, redirect their, their, their transactions, their remittances through the official channels, rather than the illicit ones that do not uh, really make it back home. So 
that's a very incisive question, but I, I wouldn't want to <laughs> go, go, okay, go more than that. Let, let me ask a question that the yeah. average Nigerian who doesn't care about all the jargon of economics that we talk about, whether it's your classical, classical, Kenya, any of this big grammar we use on television and on radio or in textbook, uh, for them, things have gone up and they don't come down. That is their own economics. And what they want to see is that prices start going down significantly. The question always on people's mind, not just regular question is, what really is stability? The stability means prices will go back to normal as it was before, or wages will meet up with prices what exactly is stability for the just explain beyond the textbook so that people can begin to understand what we are in there are two policies that brought us here removal of fair subsidy floating of the uh, exchange, rate. exchange rate and we're here some people are saying should we start rethinking that policy there are so many things going on what stability so stability is about expectation okay so that's what you expect the price to be from the last time you were in the market, it will still remain the same. Even if it changes, it won't change at a rate that will hurt you. So that's stability. So, so we're talking about rates versus levels here. So the level is not important. What is important is the rate of change. So you can be at a high level and stay there. So each time you know, okay, so because your expectation will somehow be, be uh, um, anchored on where they, you know, at the level. So when you go to the market, you don't expect it to change uh, very much. So that, that helps you. It helps your planning. So you can also predict the, the, the other economic uh, indicators. So that's what stability is. Now, can we ever get to, that le to the level we were before the removal of the sub first subsidy? Um, not at all. Okay? But it's possible for us to get there if, we, for instance, we begin to have some more competition in the, uh, in the let's say, the downstream uh, petroleum marketing, you know, more refineries come on stream, and then that big competition begins to drive down price. But that is not something that's going to happen in the short or medium term. I don't know how long that will take. So we move from, uh, how much was it? 160, no, uh, how much was fuel before the removal of subsidy? That Less than 200. Less than 200. Now to... 600, 500, 600, right? So, um, and this is a critical input to production, to, to, to consumption, to everything. So I don't think, uh, is there nobody that doesn't spend something that related with fuel inputs in any day? There is none. So because of that, you cannot expect inflation to go down to pre-subsidy removal uh, you know, levels. It cannot happen. So, but what is important to the consumer and the economy is that there is predictability. That each time you go, now the problem is if you go to the markets, you know, um, in fact, prices change like uh, day to day. Some supermarkets no longer put price tags. Yeah. I found that yeah, out yesterday, and which is very inconvenient. Yeah. So because of the rate of, you know, so, you know, in economic theory, you know, you don't like economic textbook theories. But sometimes we talk about the, the infl uh, one of the consequences of inflation as, uh, what is it, uh, the shoe leather cost of inflation or something like that, that, you, you know, so yeah. I can see that. The cost of menus, that you have to be changing menus every time. I thought that it was insignificant, but now I understand. So think of a supermarket that has to be changing prices every day. So the cost, you know, the burden on the workers and all of that. So what they've decided is to remove it and then put pri uh, price scanners. So if you <laughs> pick a product, you have to go somewhere and scan it and come, and that creates a lot of inconvenience. And that will also lead to loss of uh, sales for them because people may not be able, you know, want to do, go through all of those things. So the cost of inflation is high, but what is important is that there is predictability. So you are sure that the last time you went to market, the price is at this level. If you're going back, it's going to be, it won't change pretty much. So I think that's just the way wage, to do Wage that. is not, because I asked two prong question. What happens to wage? Because wage remains the same. Whether these prices become Yeah, so there's true. always an adjustment. Uh, we have to talk about wage adjustments. Um, in other parts of the world, there is what is called, what we call COLA, cost of uh, living adjustments. Okay, so um, inflation, you know, is measured, I mean, the cost of living is measured uh, CPI, and then it, it uses, uh, uh, what, what do you call it now? So there's some adjustment level for every wage. So each, time, each year, 
uh, firms decide based on inflation in order to make sure that uh, con um, that um, workers do not lose purchasing power of their money. All right. You know, so they adjust it upwards by the le rate of inflation. But here, of course, uh, it's not possible. But it's possible that in the, in the medium to long term, there will be that adjustment gradually. Of course, um, bargaining um, is one of the instruments used by trade unions in achieving that. And we could see that NLC threatening uh, for new, new wages, I mean, new minimum wage, wage and all of that. So we expect that things will adjust over the medium to long term. I, I need to put this in because we're talking wages and um, of late we've had conversations with labor regarding this. Labor, labor had said, give us one million. And well, I love you for that, a uh, nice one. But then we've seen some meetings here and there. But the latest one is, uh, you know, the TUC actually saying that the FAC allocations of defaulting states regarding minimum wage should be paid directly to the workers. And um, clearly we've seen states that are defaulting when it comes to minimum wage, and they've give, given different reasons. But whether it's tenable is another thing, because the president, uh, when he was speaking to governors uh, some time ago, asked them to, to pay wages, because it's important to give people money that they can spend. Fine, inflation is high, but they need to at least have some money. So do you support that, for example, for states that are defaulting, rather than giving them the FAC allocation? federal government use it to pay the wages directly to the workers, so at least uh, you can alleviate some of the, the suffering. Mm, <clears throat> I think the issue here is that you are giving, put a lot of trust in the ability of the federal government to... <laughs> <laughs> you know, so who do we then trust now? <laughs> 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 so, that's my issue here. So um, I think let's go back to what I started with, which is data. When the state governors are saying that maybe for giving reasons why they are not doing that, I think it's the Minister of Labor and the Bureau of Statistics that needs to come out to say, okay, this is your wage bill, okay, and this is how much you, re you receive. Mm. So if we have such kind of data harmonization, it is possible to tell how much, you know, I mean, you can tell what the discrepancy before you say whether the federal government will do that. But what we've seen with the removal of subsidy is that uh, it appears that, that um, you know, we are robbing Peter to pay Paul. Mm. So monies have been taken away, purchasing power has been you know, taken from the consumers, from citizenry, and then put in the hands of the states. So the states have become so powerful. Some states, their FAC allocation has grown uh, for, uh, twofold. You know, uh, more than you know, 50% is the right. minimum. Yeah. I yeah. think 40% is the minimum. Some had up to 80% increase in FAC allocation. Some states. So there's no excuse. There's no excuse. There's no excuse. Mm. Right. So I believe that labor, TLC, TUC, NLC, you know, need to you know be more active in holding the subnational, uh, subnational, because I think that's where the problem is. Most of the states. Uh, okay. I, 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 Okay, because that, go, yeah, ahead. go ahead. It, 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 it sounds like this money, subsidy money, thing sounds more like optimization to, to me. More, because there's no productivity. We're paying subsidy. We now got the money out of subsidy, and we are now giving it to government to use and run. It's not as if there's some productivity. Just that let's spend less. I don't know. You're the economist. You're the expert. But I'm just don't need to throw that throw that thought in. Yeah, so which, which is <laughs> another, another very important uh, point uh, that you're raising. Um, you know, so we have this productivity collapse that has happened in Nigeria uh, since uh, 2015, uh, and that's very key. Uh, you know, you, you you know you wouldn't know the, the 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 gravity of what you mentioned here. The economy lost almost 300 billion, 200 billion dollars over uh, eight years. When in 2015, at the beginning of 2015, Nigeria's economy was still the 27th largest in the world with a GDP uh, size of $527 billion uh, as it is today with the H rate, whichever one you use, our, our GDP is about $300 billion. So that means that we've lost over $200 billion. Okay? So we are talking about gross domestic products. So 200 billion lost in productivity means that there is no way you will not have inflation. 
Okay? So the first thing that needs to happen is to um, you know, begin to increase the productivity of the system. Uh, the policies that we are seeing now are uh, their productivity enabling. I think that's the question that we should be saying. Uh, increasing FAC allocation to the state is a productivity enabling. Well, if they can put that in you know, building core infrastructure, transportation system, everybody's talking about the logistic constraints that is uh, increasing the, the food inflation. Can we invest massively in roads infrastructure, uh, energy infrastructure? Because these are the core issues. So if this can happen, and then over the next one or two years, we begin to see a ramp up in infrastructure investment, and then uh, productivity goes up. I think these problems will you know, gradually begin to peter off. But until that happens, um, it, there is no easy answer to your questions. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I was going to backtrack <laughs> to the possibility of aligning uh, economic policy, fiscal policy with monetary policy, but we're totally out of time. Uh, we hope that, you know, things change significantly somewhere down the line uh, if and when productivity um, increases. We'd like to thank you very much, but before we do that, let's quickly remind you yet again about uh, the breaking news. Uh, the Director of Defense Media Operations, Major General Edward Buba, is calling on Nigerians, especially those in Delta State, uh, to provide any information that will lead, uh, assist the military to arrest eight persons allegedly responsible for the killing of 17 soldiers in Okwama community in Delta State. Major General Buba says the military remains determined to fish out the perpetrators of the heinous act in Delta State. And there you see uh, the pictures of those allegedly involved in the killing of 17 soldiers uh, who were interred uh, just yesterday. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Professor Bongo Adi is a professor of economics, Lagos Business School. Thank you so much for thank coming on the program. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And so when we return from this break, we'll yet again switch to that issue of mental health, but with a specific focus on someone who is doing something quite daring to help. Stay with us. We'll be right back. seeing those videos you're probably having vacation ideas thinking of what to do during the weekend but the man we're about to speak to well he wasn't doing that for vacation or recreation or what he's about to do now not doing it for recreation he's doing it for a cause and he's about to swim the whole length of the third mainland bridge the water beneath the third mainland bridge. It is not one kilometer, it is not, in fact, it's not the usual 10 meters that we're used to in our pool. It is much more than that. Why is he doing this? What is the thinking behind this? Can he survive this? Lots of questions on our minds. So let's just ask him right away. We're joined on the show this morning by Akira Doye Dari. Uh, he's a swimming instructor and CEO of Ocean 28 Swimming Academy. He's a man who's trying to dare the Third Mainland Bridge. Good morning, Derek. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Uh, we, we drive through the Third Mainland Bridge. For some people, that is enough stress, <laughs> driving through the Third Mainland Bridge. The traffic, the fact that you're surrounded by a body of water that is just vast, and that is enough for a lot of people. But you said 
you know what, I'm not going to grieve for even the military. <laughs> I want to go into the water and swim through it. You're doing this for a cause, which is something we'll also talk about. But have you tried this before? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, let me establish this fact before, you know, uh, I mean, at the Todd Milan Bridge, if anyone has done this before, no, that hasn't been done. Uh, well, I've been swimming for a while now. Uh, I do this outside the country before coming into Nigeria. So when it comes to swimming, I mean, we are somewhere. Yeah, we can say that clearly. And um, here in Nigeria, when I got into the country, you know, I started up the swimming academy. Uh, Ocean 20 Swimming Academy and then you know we've been doing quite a number of things competing and also we also did uh, the recent uh, the Gosopun Water um, Classics and I did even go there alone. Ocean 28 went there as a team and I mean we all came out as medalists you know so that was not just me alone so if that answers the question yes. Because it's the third mainland bridge water <laughs> right. <laughs> How many kilometers is it again? Uh, it's about 11.8 kilometers. So you are planning, I mean, walking 11.8 kilometers is a lot of work, uh, work rather. So you are planning to swim that length? Yes. Okay. Will you stop? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you doing this? Okay, let's talk about where you're doing this. Then we'll talk about your mental preparation for it. Okay. Um, well, I would, uh, let, me, let me put it this way. I think Ocean 28, we have a very, we have a different driving force. Uh, we actually realize that quite a number of swimming academy, you know, focus on sports development. So for me, um, we actually had the different focus, which was sports for development. You know, see what sports can actually do to impact the environment and not just so become an athlete, become very fast and you know, win the medal. Yes, I mean, we are definitely doing that because we have, we have the knowledge about that. This is not the first time going for competitions and all. We have that. But what else can we do with the craft? So, so the, the mindset for Ocean 28 is different from any other academy out there. So um, th that's actually the driving force for us. You know, mental, uh, that's mental states for us. You know, how do we pass this message across to the people? So. Well, 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 worried for you, and it's it's understandable. Uh, but I'm not quite satisfied with your answer to Kaidi's question. First of all, let me just talk about the uh, symbolism. You know, the Third Midland Bridge. We know that we've had a number of um, you know attempted suicide cases at that edge of the bridge. People jumping. Uh, some uh, were not saved, sadly, and you know tie that to. Um, your committed campaign to mental health issues and now you're doing this there must be a story behind this attempt to glory what exactly is it have you had a personal experience did you lose someone what exactly is it okay so this is it you want to hear the story it's quite lengthy anyways um, so the story actually started for me when I left secondary school. Uh, I didn't get admission for like four and a half years, you know, and that was actually, you know, writing and, you know, doing whatever it's necessary. So I was, within that time frame, I was told I was going to get, a, like I was invited to come and start working somewhere. And for like about nine months, when I got there, you know, the story actually changed and then I wasn't paid for like about nine months. But I mean, within my first, time moving down there, I felt like, okay, what else can I actually learn here? What can, what can I do here, even if I'm not getting paid? So I actually stayed there because there's nobody, nobody's giving me another opportunity. It's not like I've gone to university or anything. So I stayed there for like about nine months and then I met this particular person. Um, I can actually, you know, put out all the details out there, you know, and within that time frame, this person was very instrumental, you know. I wasn't paid for about nine months, but whatever it is that he has, you know, you know, whether it's after lunch break or something like that, like, oh, no, come, let's eat this together, let's do this together, let's do this together. And after a period of time, he got a job opportunity in Abuja, and we were so happy. The pay was even more than the manager that is running the company, and everybody was so happy for him. And uh, I think a few minutes, a uh, few 
months later, you know, we called and it was like, oh, he's starting up his own business. I'm like, ah, wow. So from you being an uh, employee to a job, a business owner, no, we're all so happy for him. And after a period of time, he just called me back and says, ah, things are not going the way it's supposed to be. And I was like, you know, whatever way I can use to support, because after that time frame, things have started, you know, getting better for me. And I'm not, like, I'm very grateful. And, you know, whatever it is that I have in my camp, I'm like, oh yeah, take, use this one, support the business, support the business. And, and then we'll go off like that after a period of time, like two, three months again, he just called one day and he was like, ah, things are getting really, really worse. And I, I think if I have my means of doing more enrich, I'll do it as like, ah, now, that's not the right conversation to be having right now. You know, you shouldn't. So I feel like maybe because he has actually tasted fortune or something like that, and you know, the, the reverse is the case now. And I'm like, no, you don't need to do that and try to help him in my own little way. You know, uh, yeah, in my own little way. Then after like two, three months again, and then he called again, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to commit suicide. I'm like, ah. And then this is, I think, is actually getting, you know, extreme and all. Then, you know, try to do the old talking and every other thing like that. And then it just goes off again. So the next time I got the call again after a very long period of time and I got the call again and I tried getting his exact location. You know, they just tell me exactly where you are. Right now, it's not like I see if I'm there, um, my company is there and every other thing. But I mean, if we are even able to bring you back in and at least put you somewhere, you know, within uh, the company so that you two can actually start life for yourself, you know, and but he just didn't disclose his location and it was so difficult for me to actually get across to him and i tried talking to some people around me and then they made me understand that ah, come this is actually this this is this is the pattern this is how people who are society this is how they behave you know step by step and they, I, I hope the story didn't end but yeah. uh, well no he's, he's still alive oh, you know he's okay. still alive he's still alive so now knowing that and like i felt like He's not the only person going through it. Mm. I think we need to voice out about it. So we made a uh, research about the bridge and then realized a lot of suicide cases on the bridge. Okay, well, thank God the person did not die because we're all trying to know how it ended and finally the person is alive. So I, I think you've answered the question I wanted to ask, why Third Midland Bridge? You've seen scenarios like this, but uh, walk us through how you're preparing for this. This is, if my mathematics is still intact, this is what you're about to do uh, it's almost like running around a standard Olympic stadium about 20 times, uh, if 11 kilometers. So, uh, what does it take? What are the doctors? Are, are we going to have doctors? Are we go what, what exactly? What are the logistics put together to ensure that you start and end safely in one piece? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, if you will ask me uh, for practice, like, uh, let me start with that. For practice, the practice didn't start this year. I mean, it started last year, and then so that it doesn't look like as if you are just coming out from nowhere and say you want to swim the Third Milan Bridge. We actually, uh, uh, um, you know, competed at the open water, oh, yeah. you know, test it and let people actually see that something is actually going on, even though the idea was not publicly out as at that time. And then uh, January uh, this year, you know, we went into full training, you know, back to back, back to back. Uh, for medicals, we, this project we are partnering with uh, LASWA, which is a uh, waterways authority, Lagos State Waterways Authority, uh, also with the help of Lack Ferry, they're supporting us with some few other things. So uh, they are providing us with a um, floating <coughs> clinic, uh, on the water throughout. We are also getting uh, boats too from Lack Ferry. We, are, we hope to get more of it because we have more spectators and journalists coming on board. Um, so the, all of these things, we have the floating clinic moving alongside while the swim is going on and then extra boats. So just in case there's anything. So we did, uh, what's it called, recce which is the water inspection, know the safe side, where not yeah, to I'm get to, where... The sharks and the fish. Okay. Yeah, so we, all, we did the recce already. We moved through the entire stretch of uh, the, the third mainland, mm -hmm. knowing where it's more, where we need to make some adjustments. in the. So even the distance can actually even go longer than that. Oh. Yes, the distance can actually go longer than that. Because Beyond after, 11 kilometers? Huh? Beyond 11 kilometers? Yeah, it might, might go slightly, be, slightly beyond that, you know, because we, there are some parts where we need to make some curves and, you know, just to 
make sure that we don't get to some um, parts of the water. So oh. we've done okay. we've done the recce, the water inspection. We know the safe side, the safe routes, and uh, every other thing. If I'm not meeting any, how long will this take? Well, we should be looking at something close to about three hours. Uh, what, what mental no. preparation are no, you no, doing? No. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> Did you hear that? Did you hear it? Three hours. Three hours. No, yeah, it should be getting to around three hours. Isn't that? I thought it could. It would be longer than three hours. Uh, well, um, there's a lot of study, you know, with the water and every other thing. When the water rises up, when it goes down, when so you know, there's a lot of study around it. If all the conditions are right, like on that day, you know, I'm sure. non-stop. Yes, non non stop. You're not taking a break. No, I'm not I'm not taking a break in between. Like, so what styles are you using? Freestyle all the way or at some point you just glide <laughs> or your breaststroke? Or are you using you know a combination of all of the styles? Uh, well, uh freestyle majorly, uh when there is a need to switch, you know, because they, they you can like face any new whatever in the water and then you might just need to you know, change and do some other things. Well, that, let's just leave it to that day. You know, when we get in the water, uh, experience will tell, and then, I mean, a lot if, of prayers. If, you, if you're so. swimming three hours nonstop, what mental preparation are you doing, you know, to help you all the way? Three hours is a long time. Uh, well, I've done 10 kilometers before, which is actually the highest that you are, you'll find at even Olympics level which is 10 kilometers. It's just at this time around, this one is stretching more than even the Olympics. So for you to be able to withstand 10 kilometers is, <laughs> is something. So it has been done like, I mean, I've done that before. I know what it feels like, when to get water, when to do this, when to do that. But it's not like you're going to like have a uh, stop, like you're sitting down and you're like, <laughs> no, 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 that's not how it works with open water. If, even if you're going to have water break, you are still swimming and then you are taking the water break, like you are still swimming, you are moving and in between that, so that's the way it works. <laughs> so. You've done 10 kilometers before, non-stop? Yes. Do you so. need to take anything? <laughs> take anything? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, this is, you don't have to you know, talk about that out here, but I mean, I'm going myself, like my, my me, I, I don't know how to put that. Uh, there are a lot of things that you don't have to do when you're trying to take this, um, uh, I mean, this is air, but there are a lot of dudes that like you don't have to do these things like trying to drink, trying to go on drugs, trying to do anything because even trying to take some, I don't want to mention all of all these things because it can just rise your uh, heart rate and every other thing and then ends up dropping you and that would be a big disaster. Be deadly. So you don't want to even go through that and the fact this particular swim because it hasn't been done in the country before, it has been done strategically. When, when is this happening? Uh, this is a uh, Saturday, right. March 30th. We wish you the very best. We wish we could join you, but we'll just be in our bathtub or in our little swimming pool, you know, cheering you on. So big ups to you. Uh, Thank you so much. Well, we call it Third Million Bridge, whatever. It's a lagoon. And the lagoon, we hope it will be kind to you. I don't know if you will drink the water. Don't, you won't open your mouth at any point, <laughs> will you? Oh, well, uh, uh, there's... Is that inevitable? you taste the water at some point, right? Well, I hope not. But there's even more things to actually face than even just even drinking the water. Right, like... like yeah, there's, there's a whole lot more. sharks in that? Uh, nah, I don't think there's shark inside there. Yeah. I don't think there's shark inside there. So what are you worried about? Uh, well, I mean, I've already cancelled any form of worry away from my mind because that's not good for me right now. So I'm just... Um, I'm one ten percent ready for this, um, but if I are looking at other, you know, little little things that I think even because we did a demo swim, we did a demo swim to actually know the kind of reactions you are going to get when you enter this water, the this, the that. We did the demo swim already, so I've experienced like a little portion. I also know that there's there are parts where you get to like the smell is horrible, like. Like it is horrible. Yeah. Yes. So there, are, there are a lot of things, and all of these things might. That's why I said it might actually even go beyond that because we might have to like change you know, your route, change the routes, you know, to. And you know, it's yeah. important to work and also raise awareness about keeping the waters clean and all of those things. But 
Thank you for the work you're doing. Mm -hmm. And we wish you the very best. We'll be rooting for you and cheering you on. You can also do that, by the way. We'll be speaking with Akira Doye Dari, who is, maybe your name is Dari. You want to dare? <laughs> <laughs> the third man, the lagoon. Thank you so much for your time. We wish you the best once again. Thank you very much. Yeah. <sighs> there you go. That's uh, how we'll just leave things for today. <laughs> a lot of things to chew on, really. But thank you so much for being a part of the show. Don't forget, Sunrise Daily is up in just about a couple of minutes. It's a full package for you, and you don't want to miss it. I'm Kaya Doki Kione. Yes, indeed. Like Dari, dare to reach for your dreams. And join us again tomorrow. We'll bring you another edition. I am Bukola Koka. Well, as we prepare for the weekend edition of the show, you can join Dari on Saturday. Check him out, see how he does this. Uh, we wish him the very best. Thank you for watching. I'm Jeffrey Uzoma.